Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Major Applications Planning Committee. I'm Councillor Edgy Labour, Committee Chairman. Um, we are live on the Council's uh, YouTube website, in addition to the small audience that's with us. Um, so welcome to those listeners uh, and viewers. Um, can I do apologies for absence first, please? Yes, no apologies received, Chairman. Any declarations of interest? Uh, minutes of the meeting, 24th of October, are in your pack. Can I take those as agreed? Yeah. Okay. Um, matters that have been, um, the changes since the agenda was published. Item 9 uh, now has a petition, so the running order will be 6 followed by 9, and then we will do 7, 8, 10, and 11. There was also an agenda B published um, as a late item, so hopefully everybody's had that. I also hope everybody's had the additional plan I requested to be circulated in respect of item 9. That should have been received by email on Monday. If anyone is looking blankly, that begins to worry me. You got it? Good? Good? I'm glad we're, we're okay with that. Okay. Let me do the usual administration uh, before we... All items are in part one. There are no, there are no enforcements on this agenda. So all, everything's part one, everything's in public. Um, health and safety, if the fire alarm goes, um, we're not expecting a test, so we will be leaving. Uh, the door you came in is your most usual route out, and the double doors straight ahead of you are normally the best way out and down the stairs. There's another exit hidden in the corner behind me. Um, can I ask, please, that all mobile phones are switched off or at least to silent? Uh, to avoid disturbing that uh, principally is those around me because they're the ones that go off. Um, in terms of the meeting, I'm sure you're all familiar with how it works. Um, the Council's constitution details the speaking rights in tonight's meeting. The committee papers um, give a very useful summary and I will just outline them now. Um, on the two petition items, petitioners get five minutes uh, to address us. Um, the traffic lights give you a good cue, you get four green, one amber, when you get to red you've had five, and I do enforce the five. Um, members may ask questions of anyone who presents to us. If they don't ask you questions, don't take offence, it's just they've understood what you've said. If you raise any new planning issues that um, we haven't heard before, um, we will make sure they're discussed with officers um, and figured into uh, decision making. On any item where there is a petition, the applicant or their agent is also entitled to address us regardless of whether the petitioner does. Um, so applicants or their agents can address us again five minutes and again you can expect questions. Um, I can see uh, ward councillors can address us on any item. I can see Council Bliss in the audience which I presume is item six and I presume you will wish to say something. Yeah. I also see Council Burrows and Council Cooper in the audience which is item nine. Um, I'm not aware of any other councillors who are planning to join us tonight, but you never know. Um, it's, it's an interesting agenda. Um, that is all of the normal announcements uh, done. I will just go through voting members of the committee tonight. I only vote if there is a tie. Um, other than that, the voting members of the committee starting at by far right tonight. I think I started the other way around last time. Councillor Yarrow, Councillor Tuckwell, Councillor Radia. Councillor Chapman, Councillor Edwards, and coming down this side of the table, Councillor Morse, Councillor Duncan, and Councillor Oswald. Uh, the officer team tonight, Alan Tilly um, is dealing with transport matters. Mandeep Malhatra, the strategic major applications manager, is presenting items tonight. James Roger, the head of planning, will offer the usual advice. And Neil Fraser from Democratic Services is clerking and would always be grateful for orange forms, um, as seen at the back, uh, to comment on the running of tonight's meeting. And Nicole Cameron is our legal advisor if we get into legal matters. Um, that's all the preliminaries done. I'm going to start, please, with item six, uh, Tesco Stores Limited, Glencoe Road, Hayes. Uh, and it when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. The application um, item number six is for the Tesco Stores at Glencoe Road. This is an existing Tesco store. The application seeks a variation of the original planning permission which was granted at appeal. Essentially they would like to vary the conditions of the original decision notice uh, to have security barriers and also to have service deliveries 
on Sundays and bank holidays. At the moment, there is a restrictive condition which prevents any deliveries except for newspapers on Sundays and bank holidays. The application site, as you can see from the constraints plan, has, has no designations. This plan is trying to demonstrate to you the service delivery route. So at present, you would come off the roundabout, go through and around the current customer car park into what is the delivery yard here. This area around here, you'll see from the photograph, it's a little bit clearer. So this is the entrance into the store. This is the, the main route down towards the servicing and delivery yard. Now the service gate is behind this tree on the left hand side, so just here. And then through the double through the gates is actually just a parking area um, for what I believe is the um, online ordering um, facilities. The application before us is recommended for refusal. Uh, the applicant has failed to demonstrate that the proposal would not adversely impact on the amenities of surrounding properties in the area by way of noise arising from the additional traffic movements, the loading and the unloading activities. Um, if I go back a step to, I don't think I have a photo of, no, if I go back a step, we're primarily concerned with the harm to all of the residential neighbouring properties which uh, rebutting the, the primary service yard. The application is recommended for refusal. Thank you. Um, the petition on this one, Mr Hill, if you'd like to come forward to the desk, uh, if you press the button in the middle of the microphone when you're ready, we'll start the timers. And obviously I would advise you at this point, you are now visible on the Council's YouTube recording. Can you press the button? It'll light up. Lovely. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Good, uh, good evening. I'm the main petitioner of, uh, I went down the, uh, um, oh, sorry, I started at Telford Way, I'm the main peti petitioner, so I've got a speech impediment, and um, got 60 uh, people to sign a petition against the noise from the lorries. Uh, this has been an ongoing thing for years, the noise from the lorries up and down the service road. That service road is open 24 hours, 6 days a week, for 52 weeks a year. The only piece we get is on the Sundays and bank holidays, and it's a blessing. You get no noise from the loading bays, you get no lorries, you get no noise from the lorries. Now, if a main, a big lorry turns up, it gets into the loading bay. We was informed by the manager that they can only get one of these lorries in at a time because they're big, and they can only swing one in at a time. So, if another one arrives and it's got a fridge unit on on on, on board, it will cut out its engine when it wants to, or we get diesel fumes coming into our garden, they turn off the engine, then in turn, they switch the freezer unit on. Now that freezer unit lorry can run as long as the people in the loading bay. So, and it's quite, it is loud. They rev up and it is loud. And we sit in the garden and you can't hear yourself speak. And one particular day, we was in the garden and we had diesel fumes coming into the garden. I mean, it's, it's had another time, but this was really, well, I got a bit, Annoyed, so I went down to see Tesco's, couldn't see the manager, he was busy, so I spoke to somebody down there, and they, I informed them about the, about the situation, and they said, look into it for me. But, uh, okay, they went out the back, the lorry's turned off. Within two hours after that, another lorry turned up, and I'm sitting in the garden thinking, is this going to go into the loading bay, or is it going to stand out, sit outside my back, back of my garden, on the slip road? It's there. So, and it's still running its engine, so I thought, what's the point? I go down there, I spoke to so this, Tesco's changed their managers, like it changes the price on their shelves. You go down and see one, and next year there's another one down there, so you've got to explain the situation again. Yeah? So I, I, we, we, do, we, we do this, and uh, it still continues. So I got in contact with Mr John McDonald, the MP, and he, he, we even saw the manager, and the manager explained that they sign uh, a form, the drivers, to say they turn the engines off when they arrive. Now they don't turn them off when they arrive, they do run for a little while, and some turn them off and some don't. But uh, if they, at night time, they turn up, the lorries turn up, and they can't get into the loading bay, they uh, bid their horns to try to get into the loading bay, because there's nobody there. So anyway, Miss, me, me, Mr. McDonald and uh, his secretary Helen went down 
to see a loading bay, and all that loading bay door was a bell push, like a bell push, and that was it. And you think the technology of today, these lorries are tracked from Tony the Depot to arrive at Tesco, as I've been told. So you think the technology will say, when a lorry turns up at this loading bay, they let it in. But they don't. Even during the day, they don't let it in sometimes. It's just take days before they get in there, and in turn, you've got a, a, a van out there running its engine. And it's, it gets to a point, it gets to you. It sort of winds you up, and mentally, it, it just gets you up. And uh, time after time, I've tried to sort it out. And I went down with a petition, and there's one woman down there, and she's explained to me that she can't sleep in the back room because of the slip road, the noise of the lorries. Now, these are massive lorries. Mm. I want to accelerate out that loading bay to get up, obviously, the weight they've got to accelerate, and the diesel fumes come out of that lorry. I, I, I just hate to think what the fumes are coming out. And not only do we get the, de the lorries running at the back, we get the, the uh, day, the day the delivery vans running up and down as well. And they, uh, they're bibbing their horns as well. So we get all that and the music. So I'm completely against the actual delivery times. I think it's just taking the mic, really. Because it's a stepping stone to, to 12 hours opening or 24 hours opening. There's a Tesco's down the road, 10 minutes away. So a massive Tesco at Balls Bridge. So anybody ever wants something to eat, it will always go down. They're around the corner to Yedin Lane. So it's just an extension because they want 12 hours opening. And I'll, it's strictly I'm completely against that because it's a residential area. The other one down at Balls Bridge is retail, a retail park. You know, and it's, as I say, it's just, it's just a continued thing, years over years over years. I've been down there, I've been there 20 years. And I live at, right, I live here. I live here. Okay. You have explained the points very well and very clearly. I think the committee will very clearly understand the issues. I don't know if the committee have any additional questions. Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much, Mr Hill, for uh, coming in and speaking about the conditions for residents. Can you tell us um, the properties that back onto this, are they family dwellings, are they places with children? Yes. Yes. So it's mixed development, yes. but there's family development yes, with children. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Could you just turn that microphone off for me? Thank you very much. Is there anyone here on behalf of Tesco's wishing to speak? Good afternoon, Chair, members of the Planning Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. The Tesco store at Yedding has over 37,000 transactions each week. That's 37,000 local residents been served in this store every week of the year, equivalent to about 2 million trips a year. My name is Roddy McLeod. I'm a planning partner with Montague Evans, uh, and I'm an agent to Tesco. I have 20 years' experience, and I've worked on these types of proposals with Tesco over the last 15 years. Uh, this year, we've amended deliverers at 10 other Tesco stores throughout the country, often raising the same issues which have been discussed here today. I'm here to let you know why planning permission should be approved for Sunday and bank holiday deliveries at the Tesco store in Yedding, and I will explain that, number one, there is an explicit requirement for Sunday and bank holiday deliveries at the store. Number two, that this arrangement will not have a significant adverse noise impact on local residents and will in fact improve the existing situation. And number three, that while we understand the comments provided by local residents, have you just heard, in objecting to the application, some of these which have influenced the decision are simply not material to the current proposals. Firstly, there is a strong oper operational need for Tesco to bring deliveries to their store on Sundays and bank holidays. The extra store at Yedding uh, fulfills a main food shopping function for local residents. It trades well and is very busy, especially at the weekends. In order to ensure that there is sufficient produce on the shelves for customers, deliveries can arrive at the store 24 hours a day until midnight on Saturday. Monday deliveries then arrive at midnight on Sunday. 
This arrangement means that the store manager experiences problems in meeting customer demand for fresh produce on Sundays and especially in readying the store for opening on Monday mornings. It is important for us to highlight that Tesco do not propose to bring additional deliveries to the store, but simply to better manage the existing delivery arrangement to meet existing customer requirements. Secondly, we have demonstrated as part of our planning application that the proposed deliveries during daytime hours on Sundays and bank holidays will not actually have an impact on local residential amenity and will in fact improve the existing situation. Our noise consultants undertook a detailed acoustic assessment for the proposals, which found that the existing attenuation measures that are in place will not or will keep noise to an acceptable level and not result in any adverse impacts. Tesco are also agreeable to the incorporation of a delivery management plan in any planning approval, uh, which is enforced at other stores around the country and which would address some of the issues which have been raised by, by the petitioner tonight. For the avoidance of any doubt, the study that was submitted with, as part of the planning application did indeed assess the effect of delivery vehicles within, or delivery movements and activities within the service yard. It is also highly relevant that in order to ready the store for trade on Mondays, Tesco bring six deliveries to the store between the hours of midnight, and 4 hours of midnight on Sunday and 4.30 a.m. on a Monday morning. Under the revised arrangements, these six deliveries will be brought to the store during daytime hours on a Sunday and bank holidays. We consider that the removal of the late night deliveries between Sunday night and Monday morning would be an improvement locally. Turning to our third and final point, while we have sympathy with the comments which have been provided uh, to the application, many are sim simply not material uh, to the determination. In particular, we are well aware that many comments were provided by local residents and indeed your own Environmental Protection Unit with regard to antisocial use of the car park late at night. Sorry. It's important to highlight that these are not relevant to the determination of the application uh, which will bring deliveries to the store during daytime hours, not when the antisocial behaviour is being taken place. Tesco continue to work with uh, local law enforcement to ensure that any antisocial issues are being appropriately addressed, addressed and we therefore ask that any objections on this ground are not taken into consideration. To close, it has been demonstrated that there is a specific requirement for deliveries to the Tesco store uh, between the hours of 10 and 9 on Sundays and bank holidays, that this will not have a significant impact on residential amenity and will in fact improve the existing situation for local residents. We therefore respectfully request that you approve our application contrary to the officer recommendation. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me just pick a couple of things up so for some clarity. Yes. I'm sure other members will may wish to ask you something else. Um, firstly, you talk about daytime hours. Um, unless my clocks have gone badly wrong, uh, 10 in the morning till 9 at night is not quite daytime. It looks a bit dark out there at the minute. I, I would suggest that's well into the evening. That's not, you're portraying a sort of daytime operation, mm. which has plenty of issues for residents, I'm sure, but this looks like it's going to go on well into the evening. So uh, am I, uh, are those timings correct? They are. The daytime issue is actually a very specifically defined term uh, when, when looking at noise issues. I, uh, I know what you're doing, so I just want to be clear absolutely. that you are giving an impression that it, to residents and to others listening to this is daytime only. I know there are specific hours where noise is very sensitive mm -hmm. at night, but I'm just going for some clarity there. But you must accept surely that at the moment um, residents get a complete respite from lorries all day Sunday. So that won't improve, will it, with your proposal? They'll get, they, they may get less overnight, but actually we've no way of controlling that. And actually over time that may creep back. And actually at the moment they're guaranteed that on Sunday and bank holiday they can't have any noise. That's correct, yeah. It's within the committee's ability to control the hours as you see fit. Uh, at the moment... Tesco bring an average of 10 deliveries to a store each day. It's unlikely to extend beyond that uh, on a normal working day. So the six deliveries being brought to the store on a Sunday will be sufficient for Tesco to be able to ready the store for trade on Monday. So I don't envisage, and I'm told by my client, that there will be no additional deliveries brought to the store in, in addition to those that already arrive. 
I'll leave it at that. Do other members have issues they want to clarify with you? I think two at least do. I'll take Councillor Duncan first, followed by Councillor Oswald. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, isn't it true that once hours are granted and have been extended, mm -hmm. um, as you say in this case, that really deliveries can be carried out any time? I know you say that it would remove deliveries between uh, midnight and 4am or whatever, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but really, if that became necessary for any reason, then Tesco's could do that. Once the hours are there, they can't be taken away, if you like, and you can operate within them according to your commercial considerations. Absolutely true, yeah, that, that, that would be right. And um, again, to repeat the point I made earlier on, it would be within the committee's powers to control the hours as you see fit. Yeah. And are you aware that this issue is one of very long standing in Hillingdon and that probably I should think all of us sitting around this table mm. probably know or, or know of that history or some of that history anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so it isn't this isn't just a one off thing and in fact, as has been reported as well, there have been two appeal decisions on this. Were you aware of that? Yes, well aware of this, and indeed the noise consultant that we're using has been working on this very store for the last 21 years, uh, you know, and, and, and running these uh, proposals for Tesco. It should be noted that in advising Tesco on how to proceed on this, we did give very careful consideration to the previous uh, applications and decisions that had been made, which were for much more intensive uh, opening hours and indeed delivery hours as well. Thank you. Okay, I think that's... Councillor Oswald, did you have anything additional? Yeah, um, thank you very much, Chairman. Yeah, thanks uh, for the presentation. Um, we heard from the petitioner that uh, engines aren't being switched off after drivers were asked to sign a sheet of paper saying that, you know, this would happen. Well, it sounds to me from the petitioner that that's already been breached, so that's not working. And the other point I wanted to ask you about was you said that this would improve the situation for residents if approved. Well, how will it? Uh, in our view, it would improve the situation insofar as deliveries between the hours of midnight and 4.30 a.m. on a Monday morning would not arrive at the store. Those deliveries would, or, would otherwise then be brought to the store between the hours of 10 and 9 on a Sunday. With, I, think, with I, think we've, I, think bought, we, I think we get the point. Mm. Um, I think uh, the other issue isn't... Uh, is relevant, but, but we'll, we'll park for now in the sense that it would appear, certainly from what we're hearing, that uh, drivers may not always be doing what uh, they should be doing. Um, Councillor Yarra, you had a question for the applicant. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, in your last statement that you made, you said that your, your uh, consultant's been working for 21 years to try and sort this problem out. But in all that time, one of the major problems that the residents have is the fact that th when the lorries arrive, there's nobody there to take them in. And that's why they turn the refrigeration units on, in order to, and there's the noise. I wonder if you've done any uh, experiments with air quality, because that's another thing, that sitting in their gardens, in come the, come the fumes. So in no way can this improve the situation. It can only make it worse, because they don't even get a free Sunday. So, you know, I'm... Can I have the question, please? Well, that's the... That's the what, what have you done about, uh, in, about stopping this? We'll do this in a minute. Yeah. From, from my understanding, the, the reason that the lorry is back up in the yard is because... or outside the yard is because, as was explained earlier on by the petitioner, only one single vehicle can access the dock at a time, causing other vehicles to, to stack up behind it. Those vehicles do run their, their engines and, and to, to maintain the refrigeration units. Uh, principally as a result of, of no council control over that. Uh, we have set out in our case today and as part of a planning application that we would voluntarily sign up to a, 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 or accept a planning condition requiring the enforcement of a delivery management plan. If that was, uh, a, if that was attached to the approval of this consent, then you would have recourse through your enforcement powers to, to take you know, okay. to, we'll, to we'll control test. Take that one there. I'll take one more committee question and then I need to take the word council on the does the company have any policies to explain to its drivers what it does? It gets to a situation where it's not unloading quickly. Do you have any defined policies? The Tesco is to be happening. Sorry, Tesco do have policies in, in terms of how they deliver to their stores. Yes. Okay. Well, I think we'll. I think yeah. 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 Good. Thank you for that. I think okay. that's. Um, if you just turn the microphone off before you leave, and then Councillor Bliss, um, please.
Right, thank you. Um, obviously, I'm speaking against this application. Um, I mean, over the past few months, I've had quite a lot of complaints about Tesco's, not just about sort of, um, vehicles, but a lot of things. Um, when they were first granted planning permission, there were a number of conditions attached, which I believe were no Sunday trade-in, stores to close 8 p.m. Monday to Saturday, and I think deliverers were only allowed 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Monday to Saturday. I mean, they've been chipping away at these conditions for years. I mean, they're now open on Sundays, they're open till 9 at night, and they appear to be under the impression that they now have 24-hour delivery six days a week, which is something I'd actually like to clarify. Yeah, I mean, one of the conditions for opening on Sunday was that the road to the car park nearest to the houses was kept closed. I'm not sure if, um, are you all aware where the barrier is that I'm talking I about? Saw it on the, on the yeah. yeah, can I just point it out yeah. on the map? Yeah. Can you put the map back? No. Sorry. If we start having Sunday deliveries, those gates are going to be left open all day. So it's not just the lorries that will be using that road. It will be numerous cars as well. And, I mean, Tesco wants to take away just this little bit of respite that they have. And can I just say that Tesco's haven't been a good neighbour to these residents. There have been a number of complaints about noise in the car park. There have been car meets, travellers, groups of people playing loud music. See, if I can funnel you in, I realise these yeah, important issues, but, uh, but I do have to funnel you to the issues that are relevant to this, because yeah. members have obviously got to just consider. Yeah, but all, all I'm trying to say is that the management don't seem to deal with any complaints, and if, if there were residents complaining about the noise, they're just ignored. No, I, so. I, I understand the point that was being made, but I've just yeah. got to be... Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I mean, I've nearly finished now anyway. So I just urge you to reject this application. But the other thing I'd like clarification on properly, which has been asked a number of times in members' inquiries, is can we say specifically what the delivery hours allowed are? Because there does seem to be some confusion. Okay? Let me, if, if officers know now, I will ask them. I suspect they don't. Um, if, but if not, I'm going to ask them now to make sure that they get an answer to, to that to you because it's a reasonable question um, for, for you to be advised of exactly what they are. So if, I'm not going to ask them to do it on the phone unless they've got the information absolutely to hand. Are you, if you, are you absolutely certain you know? Page 14 of the committee report sets out the, the hours that are permitted via the appeal decision. So we didn't grant permission per se. The inspectorate did and they restricted it to the hours set out the bottom of page 14 and the top of page 15. What the applicants want is the second paragraph. Oh. Sorry, we can give you a copy if you'd like. Okay. Can I, rather than prolong that now, can I just ask to ensure that the ward council is made aware of that because obviously it is relevant if they've been asking it elsewhere that's relevant they're made aware. Does anybody have any questions for Councillor Bliss before I let her go back to her seat? No? Thank you. We're done. Right. Um, we've heard the debate, the arguments from both sides. Um, the report is recommended for refusal, which is our starting point. Who wants to start the debate? Councillor Oswald. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, we've been here before with, with this site. There have been previous petitions. It's in the report. Um, all sorts of stuff has, has gone on there. I, I was on the, uh, the, the Central and South Planning Committee when uh, previous petitions uh, were heard, I think somewhere around 2005, 2006. As far as I'm concerned, Chairman, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed at all. Uh, so I'll move the officers' recommendations and then you can carry on. Thank you. I will hold that because a couple of other people want to come in, but uh, we'll see where. Councillor Duncan? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it is an issue of long standing. These are family houses, as has been confirmed by one of the residents, so we know that there are children. Um, 
late night noise particularly. I mean, if this was backing onto, I don't know, student accommodation that was only used partially or something, maybe there would be different noise issues. This is a residential area, family housing, and there simply must be some respite from that. I don't know what it was like during this very, very hot summer that we've had, where everybody had windows open and fans on trying to keep cool if you were having lorries um, and lorry noise and fumes. Um, I, I think it's a shame that somebody's been working on this for 21 years and not come up with an answer. I wish they would. But, I mean, it, it simply is totally unacceptable in planning terms, I think. So don't count I would second... Uh, you will second that? Okay. Yeah. I'll... I'll Councillor Edwards, I very much agree with what Councillor Duncan has said. The, the residents are absolutely entitled, in my view, to some respite from this. And it seems from the uh, petition put forward and, and also supported by the, counts, uh, the councillor in the, in the submission um, that actually Tesco's haven't proven that they are able to properly implement the control measures that they say we should rely upon. And until such time as they can prove that they can maintain their present regime, uh, entirely, I, I don't have confidence in extending it any further. Uh, I, absolutely, and, and so I would be very happy to support the moving of the, uh, the recommendation and the seconding. However, I, before we take one vote, I just want to ask for a clarity on the wording of the actual refusal reason, and that is the inclusion of customer in the third line down. And do we believe that the customers are going to be making additional disturbance as a consequence of these delivery hours, or should that be removed? I believe that's with reference to the ability for vehicles to potentially use yeah. the access road, which yes. was Councillor Bliss's point. Yes, that would, make, that would make sense, because if that access road is blocked off, that gives residents respite from that on a Sunday, whereas it's, otherwise the traffic is going to go up that road. So I think that would be relevant. Excellent. Thank you um, very much. Head of planning did that. want to add a couple of comments, and it would be helpful if he did. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I may not need, need to say this, given that I'm getting the impression um, the committee is going to support the officer recommendation. It was just a point that uh, uh, my suspicion is that this, any decision may be appealed, but our record at appeal on noise issues where residents are are highlighting existing noise issues and that gets drawn out through the appeal process, our record's quite strong in those particular cases and that would apply uh, h here and obviously, I mean, I thought Mr Hill was very articulate in, in uh, outlining existing n n noise issues and that would, um, if Mr Hill participates in any future appeal process, I think that would put us in a stronger position at appeal. Uh, Councillor Morse wanted one quick Just word, and then I think I'm proposed and well, seconded, so I will move it to the I vote. I thought the chairman was quite correct in, put in pointing out the deliveries that actually take place, and I'm surprised what was allowed to appeal, personally. So I'm in totally agreeing with you that the, the, the residents get actually one day of guaranteed repeat, which I think we should not take away. Okay. Um, we have a... We are proposed and seconded that we accept the officer report to refuse the application for the two reasons stated on page 7. All those in favour of refusal, please clearly show me. Thank you. That one is refused. Right. Uh, changing the running order, as I indicated at the start, I now take item 9, which is land opposite DS Smith Recycling Depot, um, Wallingford Road, which was the deferred application for a, a, a bus um, parking area, which we deferred um, way back in June. I seem to remember. Um, what I would draw members' attention to, though, the report before us in June was a recommendation that this be refused, um, then on highway grounds. Um, this report um, is, the officer report is now an accept report, so just please bear that in mind. Uh, there is a new petition on this one, um, but it is a different report that is before you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. As mentioned by Councillor Lavery. Uh, this was an application that's been to planning committee in the past, but it was recommended for refusal in the past. Um, there is an addendum on it, a very short addendum on this item, just notifying you that there is a valid uh, petition, and I believe petition of photographs and videos was circulated to all members earlier in the week. Back in June, the application was recommended for refusal due to the potential for harm to the highways network from buses overrunning a junction, the junction of Wallingford Road and Cowley Mill Road to the north of this map. 
don't actually think I can show you that junction. Since that time, we have held a member site visit, which was in July. And in July, the work, uh, the I think most members were present. We all witnessed uh, buses turning the, the junction of Wallingford Road and Cowling Mill Road. Uh, since that time, if I try and flick ahead to the right plan, we, the council, have implemented a series of junction improvement works. So the development site here is known to, or to the planning team as the Trimite site. It had a planning obligation or section 278 requirement to improve um, junction works at these two locations. This is actually a plan of the junction improvement works which have now been implemented and are in situ um, in this location. In addition, some double yellow lines have also been um, installed just here. As a result, the reason for refusal that we previously re uh, reported in June has fallen away as a result of the improvement of the works that the Council have carried out. Accordingly, the application is recommended for approval, subject to the conditions which start on page 87. Um, and I uh, will leave the report with you, but I would welcome any questions. Thank you. I think we need a clarification. Are all the um, required yellow lines actually in place at the moment? Thank you, Chairman. I can confirm that the double yellow lines have been installed. However, a, uh, they were consulted upon and uh, an objection report has now been written for consideration by the Cabinet Member for Planning, Transport and Recycling. Um, should the Cabinet Member be minded to approve that report, then the double yellow lines that are already painted on the highway could then be enforced against. And they are the ones that are shown on the plan? That is correct. Thank okay. you, Chairman. Right. Okay. We will... We will uh, sorry, Matt. You will... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, a petition on this one. Um, Mr Moore and Mr Gunn, I've got two possible names on a, on a, on a sheet. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for seeing me. Uh, my name is Michael Moore. I'm a resident of Cowley Mill Road and I'm also the chair of the Cowley Mill Road West Residents Association. The application uh, to establish and operate a bus depot from Wallingford Road we feel must be refused on the grounds of both safety to other road users and due to the impact on the health and well-being of the residents of Cowley Mill Road. As originally identified in your report of the Head of Planning for the Planning Committee, the application should be refused based on vehicular movements out of Wallingford Road. The residents agree that this is not acceptable and is dangerous. Large vehicles, buses and HGVs currently have no choice but to either mount the footway or cross over into the path of oncoming traffic to exit Wallingford Road. This is fundamentally dangerous and cannot be permitted. The Council have an obligation to protect the safety of everyone and cannot plan in such dangerous activities. We recognise that the junction has undergone some improvements. However, it is still very clear that large HGVs still have to drive on the footway, as evidenced by the numerous photographs that we have, uh, I've sent in, uh, that it imprint, so they're leaving their imprints on the footway, and indeed the most recent photograph, which is the one on the left-hand side, the footpath is already been broken up because vehicles are now driving through even the beds that have been recently laid because there is no way to get round this. What has happened is that you've put in a uh, keep clear box which is not enforced, it is unenforceable and nobody is complying with it. So therefore the vehicles when they come up Cal uh, Wallingford Road to try and turn left they have no choice but to drive on the footway or to go into the oncoming lane of traffic. Regardless of the safety issues, the implications of additional large vehicles to already overcrowded roads cannot be permitted. Cowley Mill Road is a minor road and it's a minor local road that has far too many large vehicle movements already. It is not suitable for the needs of the industrial estate. There are parts of the road where two large vehicles cannot pass in opposite directions without encroaching on the footpath. This is dangerous and it should not be designed in to accommodate the London plan. I want to emphasise that having the bus depot on the Uxbridge Industrial Estate does not benefit this community. It does not benefit Hillingdon. There are no job benefits. 
Indeed, there are no local bus routes down this area. There was a feasibility uh, conducted with a consultation 2007-2008 to bring in a bus route in, along the Cowley Mill Road. It was declined due to the unsuitability of the area for buses. What, uh, the, the residents of Cowley Mill Road are very concerned not just about the peak hour traffic flow, but also the majority of the movements which take place during the period of darkness. The report identifies the site as a considerable distance from the local residents, which we agree. But this is not about the site locality, it is about the movement of large vehicles to and from the site. Regardless of the already existing noise generated by large HGVs, the buses when travelling along Cowley Mill Road in the early hours do wake residents, as do, as just as much as the lorry movements do. This cannot fail to impact on the health and well-being of the residents and should not be permitted. The application made is specific to the Route 222 bus. However, the associated transport study includes details of the U5 movement. So what is to stop the depot expanding in a very much the same way as we've just heard about Tesco's? From then, without the vigilance of residents, and I would emphasise it is the vigilance of residents, more bus movements will, without doubt, be generated. What then? More retrospective planning, more disturbed sleep, more suffering by the residents in favour of commerce. I want to point out the recent application regarding 48 Wallingford Road, which is uh, an application 4653, was refused on the 28th of June 2018 due to the impact of the proposed operating hours on the amenity of the local residents, which is contrary to your OE1 and OE3 of the Hillingdon Local Plan. In November 2016, an application by Speedy Hire was refused in the, uh, because it said the proposal would unacceptably increase demand along the roads junctions in the local borough of highway network which are already used to capacity by other industrial and residential users. The scheme is therefore considered to project prejudice the free, free flow of traffic and conditions of the general highway. The residents seek assurance that the planning committee will consider the needs of the residents. Please remember that while the West London Industrial Estate may now be a designated industrial area, the residents were here first, and indeed some still live here from when it was a farm. Hillingdon Council's strap line is very specific, so please Could you put your residents first. You. That was almost time to perfection, but I just do have to hold you. Do members have any questions? No. Okay, thank you for that. Very informative. Thank you. Could you just turn the microphone off for me? Thank you. Is there anyone here on behalf of of the applicant for this one looking to speak? No? Okay, fair enough. Um, Ward Councillors, I don't know who's going first. Councillor Burrows? Uh, sorry, Councillor Cooper, it's being indicated to me, is going first. You know the format of this, so I'll, I'll let you carry on. Thank you, Chairman. I will, as ever, be brief. Um, I would like to make two short point to underline what the residents have so ably told you tonight. Um, I am concerned that there will not just be additional movements of buses, but those buses will have drivers who have to get to the bus depot and they have to get back home again afterwards. And please don't tell me that they're going to go by bus because I don't believe it, certainly not at the times that, that the buses start. So if you've got 30 buses, you're going to have 60 movements, aren't you? Straight away. So there is going to be a considerable increase in traffic on that road, a considerable increase in noise. And I don't suppose many of those vehicles will, will be um, hybrid or electric. Okay, that's the first point. Um, the second point... Um, the second point is that that junction, yes, it, it's been realigned, yes, it has um, apparently been improved, and it may not be quite as dangerous as it was before. But I've been down there, and I have observed vehicles um, doing what you have seen in the photographs, and I can add that it's, n it's not because they're dangerous drivers, it's not because they're incompetent drivers, it's because the junction is not suitable for them to be on there. Thank you, Chairman. Do members have any questions? No? Okay, thank you. Councillor Burrows?
Thanks, Chairman. Before Neil's finger hits that button, I just want to state for the minutes that I'm here as ward councillor and not in my role as cabinet member. Thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak this evening, Chairman. Um, we've heard about the overrunning on this junction. Not sure officers have been out since the junction's been done, but I certainly have. You can see from that photograph, if somebody was standing there, they would have been knocked down. This road is used by children going to and from Whitehall School on a regular basis. Um, it doesn't work. The junction does not work, even at its new width. Um, the keep clear doesn't work because vehicles do park in that when they're turning right. So what happens? A vehicle wants to turn left so it can get just about behind the vehicle, overruns the pavement. So that doesn't work. First thing in the morning, the vehicles will not be running on hybrid. They'll be on diesel because such a vehicle has to start a diesel engine so it'll be noisy and you will get that extra noise within this area. And we're saying that there's already noise in this area, so it's fine. So we can add up to another 50 vehicles and we can add 30 buses plus a 20 for the drivers. It's not acceptable. Um, there's no public transport in this area, as we've already heard. And yet in the report it states that some of these drivers will come by public transport. The nearest bus that actually runs to here is a 222. But the driver's got to get there first to drive the 222 so we can actually get on it to get back to work. So that doesn't work. Point 7.10, last paragraph, objection from highways. But if you have a look in the last line, that's been dismissed. But the objection from highways in this report is exactly the same as they put in the refusal you had before you before. So why that is still now up for approval and is no longer an issue, I do not know. Um, previous application we've heard was already refused in this area because of added um, noise and they were taking residents' side, saying it was not acceptable. Also, only two hour window from the last bus back to the last uh, before they run again. So two hour window from the bus coming in before they start running again at four o'clock in the morning. So one comes in just before two o'clock in the morning. One goes back out about four, four thirty. So two hours respite for residents. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. This is not acceptable in my um, esteem um, judgment. So I would urge you to do the right thing, overturn officer's recommendation and show that this committee and this council actually does put residents first. So I would urge you to actually refuse officers' recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Burrows. Do members have any questions? Uh, Councillor... For the, for, the, for the Councillor, yeah? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Duncan? Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Burrows. As a ward councillor, are you aware of the point that the resident, Mr Moore, made in his submission that at one point... Um, it was thought, uh, should we have a bus route in this area? And they looked at Cowley Mill Road as part of that, and it was deemed to be unsuitable for buses. Can you confirm that? Yeah, I can confirm that. That was some years ago. And then when they decided that the, uh, a large bus wasn't suitable for this area, then they thought they might be able to get a hopper bus, but they still decided it wasn't suitable and the actual demand down there would not be high enough for them to run one down there. But originally, yes, they did look for the large buses and they did refuse it because of the fact it wasn't suitable. And for clarity, these are, they may be hybrid Euro 6, but they are large buses. So it's large buses we're talking about, not small buses. Uh, any other questions? No. Thank you, Councillor Burrows. Um, perhaps um, planning will, will um, help me with... Um, as the Ward Councillor correctly pointed out, there would appear to be a, at least a drafting error in the report at 7.10. Yeah, I think I need to um, request that c committee note that the last paragraph from paragraph 7.110 should be removed from the report. It's um, in error. Um, Chairman, do you want me to just comment very briefly. Yeah, help, um, uh, help, just help to help, you, help the planning committee, uh, I, I was obviously aware this is a contentious item, so I, I did do a bit of research before the meeting in terms of how the council's fed at appeal on both noise issues and precision driving issues. I'm going to be honest with, with the committee, we've actually done rather well on noise issues. Uh, there was inferences given by the speakers to various planning references. Uh, members will be familiar with the pa Power Day appeal where uh, local residents identified noise issues and that resulted in a dismissed appeal. Uh, you've heard the 
Tesco one already, uh, and uh, uh, as I said, I did a bit of research and uh, there was a bit of a pattern that when residents identify a noise issue and then raise those specific existing issues with the inspectorate, so it's not a case where they're hypothesizing there's going to be a noise disturbance where they're drawing upon real experience, we do seem to win appeals. Um, I couldn't find any good examples on the, the highways issue, but on the noise, um, so I can't really guide you either way on, on the highways, but on the noise, if I'm honest with you, uh, the research I did before the meeting, uh, yes, yeah, so if, if, if members did have concerns regarding uh, the, the noise issues, I have to be frank, officers would be able to do um, support refusal, I'll go so far as saying support refusal, reason that appeal if members go down that path. Find out shortly. Um, okay, so we've got um, some concerns from local residents and ward councillors on um, both noise um, and weather. Uh, we all saw this junction before it was improved, of course, but whether the current improvements to the junction have dealt with the required issues. It was evident that when we were there, the bus managed precision driving, but that obviously was a test for us. But every other vehicle we saw did manage to overrun the kerb significantly. Um, so whether that's now changed with the new junction, we haven't seen it, but, but obviously that's something for, to be looked at. Um, so we therefore need to look, I think, at the noise issues. Residents are raising clear concerns about uh, the buses, the noise, the noise of drivers' cars. It is already a noisy, there will be some noise on this road already, but it's a question, we're just now about to add another chunk to the top, and it's a question whether that is, is valid at that time of the morning. Um, this, and bear in mind, the bulk of these movements, you'll see from the report, are not peak hour. It's not a peak hour concern, this particularly. It's about the stuff that goes out, because Councillor Burroughs um, pointed out to us, as did the, the petitioners. It's, it's four in the morning this starts from it, and it doesn't stop until two o'clock on the other side. So we've got another situation where we haven't got a lot in between. So who wants to take me out on this one? Councillor Oswald. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. Yeah, I'll start you off if you like. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be noise at both ends of the day. It's not just in the... Well, you've just said it. I won't repeat what you've just said. I, didn't, I wasn't keen on this application when we first dealt with it, and I, didn't, I, I know that area quite well. I didn't go on a site visit because I didn't think I needed to because I know the area. Whether or not that solved the problem or not, I don't think it has because there's nothing worse than getting a, a junction realigned, you get a nice new pavement, and then someone goes and smashes it up, and that's what they've done. The photos have showed us that already. I don't think that that junction is suitable. What else can they do with it? Well, not a lot, I wouldn't have thought. So it, it is now as it is. Do we approve this? Are we saying that that's a suitable junction for double-decker buses or even single-decker buses to go around there? I don't think it is. I don't, didn't like it last time, and I don't like it now. And I think, Chairman, that we should, or we could refuse this because of the adverse noise that, that this is going to cause. I think we all understand... Chairman, that buses, uh, where they park up overnight, because they don't run 24 hours a day, um, they've got to go somewhere. Bus garages are now totally inadequate to park up the number of buses that there are. We know that they're looking for sites all the time to park up buses. This is another one. Is it adequate? Is the junction adequate to take the buses onto the park? I don't think it is. Thank you, Chairman. Hey, uh, Council. I know Councillor Duncan's indicated. Councillor Morse, you indicate as well, I think. I, I did spot you. So I'll come up the table. Councillor Duncan first. And as well, I I'm not ignoring. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I think it is um, unsuitable. Um, I too know this junction uh, well, and we've heard from two ward councillors and from a resident representing other residents in the area who see the operation of this junction and see that it is not safe. So even with the improved junction from the Trimite uh, development, we can see photographic evidence and also hear from people both living and representing the ward that it still is not operating as it should. Um, I mean, if cars were going over pavements and uh, breaking up the road, we, we would immediately say this is unacceptable. Just because they're heavy goods vehicles, are we to operate a different standard? No, I think it should be just as um, rigorous. Also, having heard and having had it confirmed by one of the ward councillors that a previous study showed that they could not supply a bus service in this area 
to residents, not only because there may not be enough take-up of that, but because the road was unsuitable for buses, for them then to have to withstand late-night noise of buses coming down their road, which are of no use or benefit to them, just keeping them and their families awake at night, I think is an insult. I would um, move that we refuse this on the grounds that it does not meet the requirements um, of the heavy, the many heavy goods vehicles needing to access um, the site, as well as noise. Thank you. We'll, we'll deal with the refusal. If, if we go that way, we'll deal with that in a moment. Let me just take other comments first. Uh, I was particularly interested in Council Borough's evidence and um, this issue that these roads would not be considered suitable for a bus, which it wouldn't have been a double-decker bus, it would have been one of the lesser buses, but they're still substantial. And I also know in 710, the second one, the, what was, it's not the last sentence, it says the highways has objection pros in that there's a concern that will prejudice free flow of traffic. So uh, I have some concerns that the introduction of these buses would, would be, so I am actually now going to actually agree with... Uh, you're, you're, not, you're not in favour of the application? I'm against the application. Uh, I thought yes. that was where we were going. Um, Councillor Edwards, then I'll take Councillor Yarrow. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to, to understand a little bit more about the sound recordings that are in here. The, there's some data in here that doesn't mean a great deal to me. Um, towards the bottom end of page 92, based on the four buff mo movements, each with an SEL of 72 decibels. I think there's one and key o overriding. The head of planning will confirm for me. There's one key message with this data that I would draw committee's attention to. I believe, if I'm correct, this was done from one night's observations yeah. only, and best practice on noise would indicate that you do at least a week. Well, uh, the, the it's, yeah, so it's been done for one night only. Uh, what I can say is for the Power Day appeal, we this council employs noise consultants, and who I instructed, and I actually spoke directly with the noise consultants. Um, uh, so we didn't have a, one of our EPU noise officers actually involved in that particular discussion. And as part of that discussion, the noise consultant told me that uh, he needed to take uh, a week's worth of m measurements in order to add validity to his findings. And there's an element of common sense to this. That obviously, the more readings you take, the more, re re uh, more weighting and reliability they can give to those readings. And that if you only take one night's re readings... Uh, it's easy to um, discount those readings that there might have been uh, hypothetically, say for instance, uh, in terms of heavy goods vehicles, if a particular business was taking an order of new lorries or something or other that's a one-off event, if you only take one night's noise readings, that could pick up that, that one-off event, but it would be, if you did a whole week's readings, then it would e things would even themselves out. So... Um, if I was asked to be devil's advocate in terms of the detail of from pages 91 to 93, the issue there is the fact there was only one night's noise readings rather than the more technical stuff that actually follows. Right. So it was for one night, but I still don't understand the one night. I don't understand what an SEL is of 72 decibels. I know what 72 decibels. What's an SEL? And how do you get from 72 down to 48? What's happened? What does it mean? Does it mean it wasn't 72 decibels? And if it is 72 decibels, then that's substantially higher than the background noise. And, and I, you know, that leads me to support the residents. I don't understand. Well, what they're please. doing is they're ev evening out, sorry, evening out noise readings over a period of time. Uh, and so what, what the noise consultant is ar trying to argue is that there's only a 2 dB increase over background noise levels. But, again, I'm being devil's advocate here, Councillor Burr has raised a quite valid point that um, when the vehicles are leaving the depot, they won't have switched to electric. They'll be running on diesel. Uh, and so th what the noise report, uh, in, th in the more detailed report, the noise consultant refers to the fact that this, there's only a 2 dB noise increase because they're hybrid and, uh, and they're electric. Well, the diesel... Um, would potentially be a higher than 2 dB noise increase. I, I mean, don't, it, 
you say, uh, still, have still not <laughs> answered the question to me. Are we saying that when a bus moves past, it's at 72 decibels? That's the peak. And that we've gone through some calculation over a period of time to level it down to 48. Is that what we're saying here? I think that is the interpretation of, of, of the data. If, if that is the case, I remember the planning inspector in the power day turning around to the applicant saying, so you wouldn't mind if I came into your bedroom and let off a shotgun? Because over a period of time, it will be less noise. Uh, I do remember that. Yeah, this comes back to the point I was raising, where when I look at, our, at appeal decisions, when there's testimony from residents regarding a noise issue, it does seem to correlate with a much higher proportion of dismissed appeals than those cases where... Uh, it's a proposal that doesn't yet exist and residents are saying they're concerned about noise disturbance. So in those cases, the inspector tend to put more weighting on the kind of noise detail you've got here. Thank you. I, I, I will take this as a peak of 72, which is way above a background. Right. And on that I think, I think I that's a, a good decision. place to be. Thank yes. you. Uh, Councillor Yarrow, you had a, a commentary? Yeah, thank, you, thank you, Chairman. Uh, most, of, most has been said, and I'm certainly minded that... Uh, uh, we should uh, reject this uh, appli application. But I, I think we should bear in mind that uh, we can reject this application. It stops the noise of the buses and it stops the buses going over the pavement, if indeed they ever were. But it doesn't stop the other problem, which is the HGVs, which, which are, are in fact causing the problem. However, I am I'm minded to refuse. Yeah, I, I, I wish I could solve the problem of HGVs. I'll have to bounce that back to others to deal with. Um, that is a matter, um, the HGVs are not before us, and if we could deal with those, I'm sure we'd be delighted to. Um, the issue is we've got the HGVs. Do we need to make the situation actually worse, which is what we're being asked to do? If I sense all the commentary that's been made by those who spoke, and there's nobody rushing to raise a hand to do anything else, I, my sense of committee is that um, we're not comfortable with the um, approval on this one. We are looking to refuse it. Um, the two grounds that have come up are noise and highway safety. I think the issue around highway safety is we've just put a new junction in and that may need some further work or whatever. Um, whether we can sustain... Uh, 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 the legal officer's making faces at me, so that's never good when that happens to me. Whether we can sustain a refusal reason around highway safety, given that we've just improved the junction, I don't know, and I'll need to take some guidance. I would suggest that based on what residents have told us, what councillors have told us, you know, previous refusal for buses down this area, there is a, there's an absolute case on noise that seems to have been made out. Um, Councillor Edwards teased out some issues around the way the noise numbers have been uh, played with over a period. Um, that we're uncomfortable with noise and certainly, um, I think Councillor Oswald said it, residents are going to get a couple of hours break between the two because this is not about daytime noise. This is very much about, again, when families are trying to rest and sleep and, uh, and so forth. Perhaps the legal officer would just guide me a shade before we... Um, I agree with your summary. They're the two grounds that I've heard this evening. In relation to the um, highways elements of safety, I think given the new junction, you're going to be limited on your grounds um, of appeal there. Um, your stronger ground is noise, and I think um, James Roger has explained that essentially the data that's been provided to the um, council under the planning application, it only shows a very limited period of time and doesn't actually give you a full understanding of the noise impact and therefore you don't have sufficient information before you to make a decision on that point. We've heard from residents um, as to the noise complaints. That's always very helpful appeal. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a cold. <coughs> um, so I believe that your strongest ground is under noise, and, I, and I, w I would move forward with that if you were minded to. Okay. Thank, thank you for that helpful guidance. Um, it, it, without the junction work, we definitely would have had a safety one and definitely would have had the highway junction one would have been there it, it, it's slightly difficult the junction's just been done um, I would I think it, the suggestion we're getting very strongly from, from, from the legal officer is that we move forward with a noise based refusal reason I'm not going to attempt to formulate that here because that is um, work that um, needs a little bit of careful thought um, and the head of planning hasn't come with a sort of ready made one so um, uh, if, if members um, 
move this in a moment, and I'm sure I'll get a, a, a more than one hand when I ask for this, uh, that we, re we overturn the officer report and refuse it based on noise grounds. I would then ask that it is delegated to myself and the Labour lead to agree the final wording with the head of planning on that, if, if everybody's comfortable with that, because I don't think it's fair to ask the head of planning to try and work it up in his head now. Are you happy with that? <laughs> he might do, but it's hard work. Councillor Morse, would you be happy with that, Councillor Morse, if we go that road? Uh, I am. I'm only one small point I've raised. Yeah, is sure. We've seen pictorial evidence of a new junction. A junction has already been damaged. We saw that as, as evidence. And uh, how does that explain why it's safe? I, I understand that point, and, and I'm absolutely behind the noise. Where... I, I have some difficulties. The junction layout is that there, I have heard no evidence to say this has been caused by buses and the site visit saw that buses could turn and therefore it would suggest to me that having improved the junction that is not a, a strong ground for... Uh, so yeah, so I, on, the, on, on noise I'm, I'm comfortable. Yeah, just, so on the highway, so, so the, the new junction as I understand has been designed to deal with 16.5 metre long heavy goods vehicles. So what's going to happen at its appeal is the applicant's going to produce lots of traffic, tracking diagrams. Yes, we can try and counter those with local, uh, um, uh, you know, the feedback from local residents. I understand there's even been videos taken of the vehicles mounting the curb. But, <coughs> it, yeah, it, I, I can only... I can, my best guess within, would be an inspector is going to put a lot, a lot of weighting on the tracking diagrams. I think, uh, I think we, the head of planning and the league advisor are saying the same things. Um, so I suggest, can we take a move forward? Councillor Oswald, will you move, move this forward? Yeah, for me? yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. Yeah, I'll move re refusal on the grounds that we've, uh, we've spoken about. On about noise. noise, adverse noise. Look, let the inspector, if he goes to appeal, let him do what he likes. I mean, we're entitled to make a decision on what's before us and the evidence that we've heard from the petitioners and the board councils. Fine. Happy with that? Um, Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Um, what do we do about the evidence we've heard, which seems to have been confirmed, that Cowley Mill Road is unsuitable for buses. That is a very specific issue, very specific piece of evidence, um, known by local people, local council, councillors, and subject to uh, an approved survey. So that, are we just ignoring that? It's a very good point, actually, Councillor Duncan. I'll just ask Amanda to, to offer some guidance to me. She, she flagged her hand, so therefore she gets the chance. <laughs> When, when you're looking at whether the route is suitable for a bus, I assume you're looking at the whole route, not just this part of the road. So it, it's a road that's fit for purpose, so fit to serve HGVs, cars and buses. Whether the route and this part of the road was unsuitable for that particular bus is probably arguable, especially because of the width restriction on the bridge. So I don't know whether that's a substantive ground for refusal. I'm a little worried about it's clouding it's this one up with well, more than one thing no, in it. No, we're, we're looking at issues really of amenity, in, to a certain extent, yeah. noise, and also if uh, a previous survey determined that it was Cowley Mill Road was unsuitable for buses, we don't have that information here. But if it is yeah. something that is relevant to this, then I think that should be included at this stage yeah. because this is an application about buses going down Cowley Mill Road. So it's so direct that we shouldn't ignore it. Hang on, I'm just waiting for officers here. Councillor Chapman, sorry, I'll, I'll take you whilst I wait Thank for Thank you, officers. Chairman. I'm no expert, but my understanding is that obviously we're discussing buses coming out of Wallingford Road turning left. We are. And, 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 and doing the reverse. And, and indeed the reverse. The whole point being, though, that to the right, of course... You can't. There's an up-back bridge. Yeah, my understanding is that the route's not suitable for buses because, purely because of the up-back bridge. I don't know, and I haven't I don't got know that, that for knowledge. fact, but that's always been my assumption. Alan, have you got any other bits you can add to this? Uh, yes, just to confirm that uh, to the right is a humpback bridge over the Grand Union Canal with a 7-foot width restriction and a 7.5 ton weight yeah. restriction. That junction uh, has had swept path analysis taken on it. 
for a 16.5 metre six axle articulated lorry and that was shown to negotiate the junction satisfactorily. Problems are occurring due to de uh, driver behaviour, not the design of the junction. Can you offer us anything on, on why that bus route? Because the council is raising the valid question of whether we, we tie this refusal around the fact that actually this road has been deemed unsuitable as a bus route, therefore buses couldn't go up and down it properly, although of course the reason for declining for a bus route could be various and not just road safety, of course. Do we have any evidence to... I, I am aware that the, uh, there were once proposals for a hopper bus along uh, Cowley Mill Road, uh, which of course are smaller in size than uh, the double-decker buses that are currently using uh, Wallingford Road as a depot. The specific question whether Cowley Mill Road was ever rejected as a uh, bus route <coughs> on highway grounds as opposed to passenger demand grounds, I don't know. Um, but it's something I can take back to the office and uh, research for you. Okay, I, I, have a, I have a suggestion which I think may take us forward because we need to move this on. Um, I don't think we can answer that one tonight. If this road was rejected on highway grounds for running buses in the past, I would be minded to agree with the councillor's concern that in fact why should we be allowing the buses to run down there at all? If we said it's not suitable to run buses on, but could I suggest that we move forward with noise, ask the research to be done. If that research indicates that the, um, it was on highway safety grounds that that bus route wasn't proceeded with, and the evidence will be there one way or the other, then I would ask for it to come back, that then we can, we can look at adding an additional refusal reason to it. Does that... Does that I, I, think, I think we're going to add new stuff to it. I want the committee to minute properly. Yeah. I'm happy to, to, delegate, to take a delegated on agreeing the wording of something, but if we're adding other bits to it, I think we need the evidence pattern to be very clear, and at the moment it's, it's a bit muddy. Yeah. Um, in relation to the um, document um, policy, whatever it may be, that where this evidence came from, can we take account of the date? and the fact that obviously in the junction has been improved in when con considering it. It's just I am concerned that the document that we're talking about may be of some age. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that that's taken into account um, when you're reviewing well, it. If we delegate that to the Head of Planning to investigate, mm -hmm. if he and the team feel that having looked at all the facts of that, it's sustainable, then it comes back to us to be look at being added. If they don't, then we'll, we'll stick with the noise that we've got. Uh, it wasn't just about... The jun this junction. It was about the road. The road yeah, no, I also get the legal officer's very careful guidance that this junction has been improved. And maybe the road has been improved. I don't, I don't think Cowley Mill Road has, from my knowledge of it, and I do know it as well. Um, okay, in that case, um, I have a proposer. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Oswald. So we are seconded that we're going to overturn the officer report. Um, on noise refusal grounds, the precise wording of which will be agreed outside the meeting between myself and the Labour lead uh, following advice from the Head of Planning. All those in favour of refusal, please show. Noise. Yes. Good. Thank you. That's that one done. Right. I move backwards in the agenda, or forwards, and we're not going forwards very fast tonight. Um, item 7, 30 to 32 Blythe Road. We're out of petition territory now, so we are um, a little more mobile. Um, could, I draw, could I draw members' attention before we start this item? There's a substantive addendum on this item. It is mainly changes to conditions or additional conditions that weren't included in the report, but it may affect some of your questions. There is a, a very long list. It's two and a half pages at least, so it's a substantive, and it's in fairly small type, so those who's, um, it's an eyesight test as well, um, this one. If it was written in normal type, it may have been longer. Uh, <laughs> yes, you've been caught. Uh, as you're ready, please. Thank you, Chair. Members, the application under Agenda Item 7 is for a site known as 30 to 32 Blythe Road. It is, if we go through the plans, it's currently designated as strategic industrial land. 
Now under the local plan review and the local plan part two, the, the site is proposed to be released as an employment site and is designated as a mixed use redevelopment site. So the site itself adjoins applications that have been to committee before. So we have what is otherwise known as Gatefold uh, over to the west and the Paradigm site, which is over to the east. Now, the Paradigm site, most of you will know, is the site that's stopped work midway through and but has restarted now. Um, so this is what we would otherwise call the, the final part of the jigsaw on Blythe Road coming forward for redevelopment. The application seeks permission for 118 new residential units with some commercial space at ground floor level. The application is recommended for approval, and I'll just take you through all the reasons why. Um, we are looking at a site, so if we look at the site context, we can see that the paradigm development is in its finished form, <laughs> will look like that, it's mm -hmm. currently under construction, and gatefold, which is actually complete, is over on the other side, and so this, the application site would infill what is currently a single story warehouse building. The proposal comprises of essentially three blocks. Block A fronts onto Blythe Road, opposite otherwise uh, a row of terraced housing and then block B and block C are abutting the um, the other boundaries are the southernmost of which is the railway line. At ground floor level the application site proposes residential homes with front doors which is quite unusual for um, the area onto Blythe Road as well as the commercial unit in the far corner in all other respects, the ground floor level is a car park providing um, parking for all of the for commercial uh, the commercial unit to the east as well as the residential units. At what we otherwise known as first floor level level, which is going to be referred to as the podium um, throughout the presentation, we have an area of amenity space centrally located, and then we have an essentially an L shape to the rear, and that's blocks B and C go through this is um, the planting plan for the proposal so there is planting proposed along the frontage we obviously there will be some on the podium level as well so that's the podium level <coughs> landscaping proposals to serve the residential development I think one of the key things I forgot to mention is that the access will be provided along the western boundary these are indicative sections showing the parking at lower ground at ground level and then the podium deck above. We have the ground floor and the landscape plan here. This was actually one of the plans that's been superseded from your pack, so this you may not have seen before, but I can come back to it if you would like to see this again. Uh, the ground floor plan again, parking predominantly along the frontage. You have three-storey townhouses, so this is the first floor of some of those homes. And at second floor level, this is the uppermost floor of the the homes that are being provided with the flats wrapping around here. When we get up to the fourth floor level, blocks B and C break away into two independent blocks. This is primarily to ensure that there is sufficient outlook and daylight and sunlight being provided to the residential units in this location. I will go through and point out some, I've got some additional plans at the end which try and clarify some of the separation distances between the various developments. So we go up to 6th and 7th floor level and then the proposed 8th floor plan is actually the top floor, otherwise the ninth floor of the building. So the reason it's called the 8th floor plan is because it's ground plus 8. So apologies, apologies if that's quite confusing. I know that that was one of the things raised um, as, as a slight confusion, people thought that the ninth floor plan was missing, but it's not. It's this flat. It's this plan, which is the top floor. We have a roof plan with some proposed uh, PV panels, so there is no amenity space um, at roof level, and there's some contextual um, proposals of how the building will sit between the currently under construction paradigm and the completed gatefold development. There have been there's been quite careful consideration about the relationships on either side and also the separation distances. These are some of the detailed elevations. So on the Blythe Road frontage you will see the the townhouses on the right hand side of this image and then the commercial low rise development 
on the left. These are the northern elevations, which show the slightly more shaded area, so the taller buildings to the back, but the Blythe Road frontage is primarily low rise. <coughs> These are the proposed south elevations, so there's the train that would otherwise pass the site, and this is what you will see from the train line. And as I pointed out, blocks B and C break at upper floor levels to ensure adequate daylight and sunlight and separation distances. This is the proposed western elevation, which is abutting the gatefold development, which is completed. And this is the eastern elevation, which abuts the paradigm development. I did want to point out some of the relationships here, because this elevation does obviously have a significant number of windows, but all of these windows do not actually look out onto any built form. The paradigm development is such that these would look out onto nothing, because the paradigm development is only two to three stories at that point in uh, at the built form where the paradigm development does about the, the bellway scheme there are uh, windows which are provided via I can't remember the term Oriel windows sorry uh, so the orientation and the view is not towards the actual paradigm block it will be away and therefore the separation distances are actually being met as a result. I think I have some better plans which try and demonstrate everything I've just said. So we do have wheelchair accessible plans, etc. This is an ex this is a useful plan in demonstrating that the separation distances between what is the application site centrally located is 21 meters and increases to nearly 26 metres adjacent to the gatefold development. The gatefold development does have habitable room windows facing onto the bellway scheme, hence the reason that it is essential that those separation distances are achieved. Whereas the paradigm development, and I can show you on another plan, this is the consented paradigm scheme, has no windows serving habitable rooms along its flank elevation. This is the application site here. So if I go back, as a result, there is an Oriel window here, which provides outlook in this direction. There is a chamfer to this built form to ensure that there is adequate daylight and sunlight and outlook for the development at the paradigm scheme. The application is proposing 40% affordable housing. If you go to your addendum, the first page sets out the breakdown of the affordable housing delivery. Oh, sorry. Gone too fast. Um, I think it's important to note that we are achieving within the affordable um, delivery 13 family homes, um, which are much needed within the borough. We are, the, the scheme has been through a viability appraisal, so the application is able to deliver 40% affordable housing, but it is not tenure compliant we should be achieving under London plan or and our own local plan requirements 30% social rent on London affordable rent we are only achieving 25% however the other 75% we are achieving shared ownership and it is considered to be the maximum the scheme can deliver and we consider it to be acceptable as it is actually over the 35% minimum we're achieving 40.3% accordingly the application is recommended for approval sorry I well, just quickly add to what Mandip said. Uh, in terms of the affordable housing offer, in my opinion, the seven best units on the site of the three-bed townhouses, all of those are affordable rent. So that was a very attractive aspect of this scheme to our housing team. Uh, uh, and so effectively what you've got is a development that follows all the design principles of its neighbours in terms of massing scale, but then offers a stronger affordable housing offer than we were able to achieve on the two sites either side. So... Um, that's it, this development in a nutshell. In terms of the addendum, uh, m although there is two very small print pages <laughs> in terms of condition changes, it is basically mostly housekeeping. Uh, so officers can go through that in detail, but it's just uh, making sure we're precise on, on uh, all the air quality uh, issues, the, the balcony details, and uh, the noise conditions and that sort of thing. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the other one I would draw members' attention to, um, which I think is very relevant, is that 
there's an additional condition on external lighting. Um, it hasn't been slipped in the bottom of landscaping, as is often the case, because there, there's a pedestrian access to this site, which is right down the site um, on a road and also an underground car park. So we actually want to see the full lighting scheme to make sure that that is appropriately lit um, and that the Metropolitan Police are comfortable with that from a uh, design perspective um, because uh, obviously those on occasions can um, be not as intended and uh, it's not a short one, it's quite a long, the, the, the car park access also the testing access to back two blocks. Okay, I'll open it up. Who wants to take me out? Count Threadwoods. Thank you, Chairman. Um, a reasonably attractive uh, design, uh, and it must, uh, from, from the, the presentation uh, provided by Bellway, the graphics, it look, does look attractive. Um, a couple of issues. Firstly, for me, the actual density of this development, uh, I don't believe that the report, if, if I have read the other planning applications right, it is sufficiently transparent. Um, it's suggesting that the density is in line with both Paradigm and, and Gateway, and it, to my reading, it isn't. It's substantially higher, up to a third higher in some cases. Um, Can you just clarify where in the report that is for me, Cal? Uh, certainly. One second. Let me just, just to help members, given the... There you go. You've got it better than I have. 50. 7.02. Uh, page 54. You know, th this is a density that is above the London plan, it, and it's, to my reading of the gatefold application and the paradigm application and approvals, it's substantially above both of those. Um, you know, the gatefold is, is uh, 185 units, and, and this is considerably above that, and paradigm is for 656 habitable rooms, and this again is considerably above that. So we are right at the, the top end of, of density. And that then begins to un raise questions for me about looking at, okay, the amenity space, well, we are short, but it's a town centre and we can look at it. Parking, we are tight, and the commercial, which I'll come into, I don't think the, the parking consideration for the commercial is fully policy compliant. The actual plans, I only saw nine wheelchair-adapted units shown on the plans. Um, I got the impression from the reading and the conditions that the other three would be the townhouses if they were needed and we would put the lifts in. And my question is, having looked at the plans of the townhouses, are, are they adequate in size of floor area once the lift area is subtracted from the living accommodation? It's quite <coughs> specific, the um, conditions. So I wonder whether we're actually shoehorning a little too much in here. Uh, but I have to balance that against it is an attractive design uh, and will enhance the area visually I think and it is delivering social housing so I'm stuck in a bit okay, of a balance let me, here, let me, but I would like let's to try and open that out let's deal with this, this density bit because I, I see the page on page 54 but I can't see your other references as to where you're doing your comparisons no you, you actually have to look at the planning application for those two ah. and, and see what they say uh, and that's the planning applications and what it states. All right. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to yeah, understand where the, where the information was coming from. Perhaps our uh, last officer's uh, comment. I'll just say we, we, we can't refuse an application on density per se. We can only refuse an application if there's an issue that comes from the higher density, such as overlooking distances aren't met and man different teams from <laughs> had, had loads of meetings on this particular issue. So it, it, it kind of, there might be a bit where it's on 21 metres, but it meets the 21 metres, I think was the point. No, 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 I, I, I do accept that point, but I did go on to say that it has raised some issues, and one of them is I couldn't see the 12 wheelchair units, which I believe we're specifying. Um, we're specifying 10%, so it's 12. Yeah, and uh, you know, if there are only nine drawn, where, where are the other three? There, I couldn't see 12 disabled parking spaces. Where would those additional ones be drawn? Because I didn't see much give in the, the floor plan. So this is where the density bit made me look at it in greater detail, and I just felt that actually we are... Uh, I'm not sure that we are fit everything in properly. I, I, I have 
said on, uh, there was a case recently to this committee, I did highlight that there was some deficiencies in accessibility. It was a scheme in Northwood. I'm not aware of any deficiencies on this scheme. Uh, 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 I can... Um, well, to find, to find the units, you'd have to check all nine levels of floor plans, wouldn't you? So as long as we approve it, that it's policy compliant with 10%, then if it's not, it can't go ahead anyway. So, Well, we can't approve the plans. It will be my submission, because at the end of the day, the plans don't show the 12, and actually they well, show the layout of the disabled uh, flats, and they only list nine. They don't list 12. So In, in where? Uh, that's in the plan pack. They actually give uh, the I, I plan. I have to say, categorically, over 10% of the units on this scheme are big enough to be wheelchair accessible. Um, but I'm going to ask Manta if she can add anything. I don't actually have anything more to add, just that they, uh, the townhouses would be of a sufficient size to add a through the floor lift. Um, with regard to parking, I do. We only need nine. And by the way, it's 88 spaces, so 10% would be nine, wouldn't it? We've got eight. The, the updated plan that has been superseded by virtue of the addendum is the one that's on the screen. And how many's that got? And it shows one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in total. Yeah, but that, there's a superseded. That's the problem. We've got an inaccurate plan in the plan pack, which was picked up. So the one on the screen is the one that's superseded. Well, it's between eight and nine, isn't it, at 10%? Because it's 88, so well, we're conditioning 12. You know, that's that's at uh, paragraph four, page 25. 12, 12 accessible car parking spaces. I'm not sure why we're conditioning 12. Sorry. And, and I believe we're, we're conditioning 12 accessible rooms, uh, 12 accessible dwellings. We are conditioning 12 accessible rooms. We're conditioning 10%. Yeah, that's 12. Yeah. 12. So just to clarify. I think that condition should say nine accessible car parking spaces to meet the policy. Um, I, I think the, the officers made an error um, b the because the um, yeah, so we b because it'd be ten percent of the of the point seven five. Um, I, I I'm sure the developer won't find a problem um, identifying an additional space that can be wheelchair accessible on the parking layout of committee are happy to delegate that minor change to to me. Are we comfortable in having three disabled accessible residents without vehicle facilities? Well I thought our standards were that we did have to provide for each unit and I think this was raised. Mm. That the well we, that's where we do one to one parking because we always have this debate when we don't do one to one parking. Sorry, how, how do you become mobile if you're wheelchair bound? Okay, we can. Uh, it's easy enough, but the, the, you know what will happen in a minute. We'll put the disabled numbers up, and the overall parking for the thing scheme will come down. Uh, if that's what committee wants, that's easy to change. But that's not a reason to. At the end of the day, there's a certain amount of space. At the moment, we're achieving 0.75 on the parking. If you up it, I suspect you'll squeeze the odd one in here and there. But in the end, we will lose a space or two, I suspect, is the end answer. I, if all, that's committee's view, that's fine. Or, or alternatively, we reduce the proportion of, of wheelchair accessible property down to the, to the eight or nine, which I, is in the plans. I would, I would rather have 10% wheelchair accessible properties. And, and we may only be able to find, we've got nine floors of plans to look at here. I, I, I accept, but they have, they have shown the floor layout of the wheelchair accessible flat. I'm sure they could adjust shows one and it or adds two up to nine, yeah, which are I, the ones shown. Yeah, but I'm sure they could they adjust three change. more. That's all they have to do is adjust three more, isn't it? Yeah. But, but fine. If it can be done, I have no problems. If members want to delegate to me that, that we achieve a certain number of wheelchair accessible units and parking spaces, then basically I can go to the developer post committee and either they change the plans and deliver that, or if they can't, it comes back to committee. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't think on a scheme of this size they're going to have a problem doing that. I, I, yeah, I would I, be more I, worried if it was a, a, a much smaller scheme than it was physically impossible to achieve. Councillor Morse. Um, basically, I agree with uh, Councillor Edwards' summary. Uh, this is a good design. It's interesting to step back because you actually reduce the light reduction 
on the other side of the road, which I thought I thought was a, a good feature. And I also take the view that because this is near the Cat Sound Centre, his other point he raised up about disabled access, I think we should actually be prepared to sacrifice car spaces for disabled ac access because I think people would be inclined to live in this location. Uh, I think about so I think that is actually a, a positive point. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. That's easy done. Any others? Councillor Oswald, Councillor Duncan, anybody else? Don't know. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy with that to increase the, uh, the disabled car parking space. <laughs> well, it, all we're effectively doing is making them change the plan to meet the conditions. Exactly right, yeah. And on, on that basis, I think it's a pretty good design. And as my colleague, Councillor Morse, has said, the way it's stepped back towards the railway line, it's not going to interfere with anybody. It allows the light to, to move uh, as, it, as we would like it to. And I'll move the officer's recommendation on that basis. Yeah. Duncan, did you want to come in? Yes, thank you. Um, on page 49, it refers to the use of the courtyard being very limited because of um, limited uh, sunlight. Um, and because of this, that's why this 175,000 contribution is being made to public open space. Can I ask where that public open space is? What, which is the public open space we're improving? Yeah. Yes. Cranford Park. Cran Cranford Park. Is the intention. Right. So. so yep. Thank is that you okay? for that. Yeah. That the makes other sense thing in relation to this location. Yes. Well. Ish. <laughs> it's in the right sort of area. It's a long way away. Sorry, if I, 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 know, I know what the legal officer is going to say, is that the head of term is basically focusing on improving open space in Hayes, yes. uh, but it, I think what the member was asking me is do officers have a particular park in mind, and the honest answer is we do, it's Grandford Park. Yeah. Okay. Fair That's question, fine. fair answer. Um, the other thing is that it says this development is in an area of um, poor air quality, this is on page 65. It does. Is this above the legal limits? The air quality management area without a doubt. Well, everything's in an air quality management area. Well, we know that. But, um, yeah, is this... Because it has been going down, the, so the readings, I, I believe, for uh, some inexplicable reason. I know I'm not answering your question, but we've got... The air quality officer has sort of contribution, which is 45917. Yes. And the addendum has additional air quality conditions to make sure that everything the air quality wanted... Officer one are now in the it's all either in the report or now in the addendum yeah um, it, it wasn't in the original version so this is mechanically yeah it, it's the you I, and I know, favorite, yeah, I, so I, 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 I know it's one of your non-favorite yeah. answers but piece of that. the only other thing that I would say in relation to councillor Edwards uh, point about density mm. is that where things are above density as they are in this case it's in the policy, in the London plan and in our own plan, that more affordable housing should be sought um, to compensate for that. And in this case, although I understand what is being said about the affordable housing element, um, it's 25% rather than the 30%. So they've got their higher density, but, you know, less, less provision. But I understand that we have limited powers to to deal with that, which is unfortunate. But, um, Our powers as are, are as they are. And they are, um, yes. Yeah. So Thank to be, you. To be fair to the applicant, we, there's a lot of negotiations on this one. Officers actually pushed really hard on the affordable housing. Uh, and I'll be really frank, we, we wanted to get a better deal than we'd achieved on the side, 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 either side of this one. And um, so there, there was a lot of negotiations behind, behind the scene to get yeah. as good an offer Can I, as possible. In that yeah. case, um, I'm not sensing any other uh, hands on this. Uh, Councillor Edwards, are you okay? So, sorry, I'd, 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 I'd like to just it. press the commercialist uh, premise as well and the parking standards for that. It's quite a wide range of uses we got, we're, we're agreeing here. Uh, and some of those uses, three parking spaces, he's... he's okay, I'll ask, a question. I'll ask a question and then give committee a choice. You know what I'm going to do. I'll ask the, the highways officer, in terms of this size of commercial unit, is that parking level uh, deemed acceptable? Because, effectively, the more we add in the commercial unit, the more I take out the residential is what you're going to do in a minute, and it 
No, it's, it's free, free choice. Or, or limit the commercial, the use classes. The trouble is, if you limit the use classes, you limit the possible occupiers. You end up with them with a vacant unit, and then we end up with the usual problems. So. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, the car parking standards are on the lower spectrum of what uh, is council guidelines. Um, the Council's policy refers to the London plan for these use classes and should the development be use class excuse me should the development be use class A4 then up to 22 car parking spaces may be required but that varies between 4 and 22 so there's a range Chairman I, it's a difficult one. The, the commercial occupier who takes this will know what it's getting. I personally, and committee can guide it, you know what the quantum is that's available. You can split the allocation, but you will then make the residential issue worse. So I will... I, ju I just wonder whether or not we can, accepting the limitations on that and, accept, and noting the fact that it's a parking management scheme in that road, adding the 106 the standard rider that actually you can't obtain a parking permit here or a business parking permit as well and then they are truly getting what they see um, otherwise we're just moving this problem into the residence yeah I, I, that I don't have an issue with could I could I could I suggest something else just um, there's, a, there's a very large quantum cycle parking which I know is London plan and all the rest of it we also know in reality it tends to sit there and take up a large amount of space. I mean, would members be adverse to losing a little bit of that, and maybe that works, makes the car parking work better? I'd be very happy to lose a lot of it. It's dreadful to see it just wasted. Okay. Could we therefore delegate to the head of planning? Um, we want, notwithstanding the approved plans, we would, we, they must be 12 wheelchair accessible it says it in the condition but let's be absolutely clear we want 12 wheelchair accessible units we want 12 disabled parking spaces we are amenable if required um, for a reduction in some cycle spaces if that is needed to achieve this we also accept and understand that it may result in a slightly lower level of parking if we can't do it that way um, and the council raised a valid question. It isn't in the S106 about the parking permits. This is a permit parking area. We should be. We should be yes. Therefore, we will. If, you, if members are so much, apart from uh, the normal rider says, apart from blue badge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and include the business in that as well, not just the residence. Well, business entitled to space in the residence area. Yeah. Okay. Well, in that case, make. Can but create a demand for one to be installed. Right, okay, well, let's put both in and then we're, we're covered. Anybody got any other issues with this one or are we comfortable with someone take me forward? Just a couple of additional conditions, maybe. Conditions? Yes. Ah, in addition to the big list that's already there? Yes. Go on. I, I noticed that uh, the next door neighbours, um, when, when their planning permission was agreed, there were conditions on the frontages to the commercial units, which I think might be helpful. Um, making sure that they're glazed and uh, roller blinds have got to be agreed by the council to stand it to stop them becoming just shuttered and uh, desolate in the streets. Well, if we've done it just along, that would seem sensible, and I'm sure the head of planning will accept that delegation from us. Thank you very much. I, I don't understand bird hazard plans, but you know, it's, they're on the next door neighbour buildings. We've required them, but we're not requiring them on this, this one. This normally tends to be whether the they normally come from our friends at Heath Road, don't they? No, they're, 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 there aren't roof gardens. There's there aren't roof gardens. Uh, uh, fine. There's a particular reason why I asked. Fine, fine, fine. Thank, thank right. you very much. Any others? Uh, there was a lot of condition change on this. Any others? I just the vibration. I understand in the report it says that's dealt with under building regulations but so is noise but we have noise conditions in here I just wondered why noise gets we conditioned and vibration can we don't stuff. normally but I don't know why noise always does in these and quite rightly um, yeah but being next to a railway line I would have thought vibration might be a consideration I and I wonder why we do with well, noise perhaps and it can help us with why we do it there is a noise and vibration report which has been reviewed it recommends mitigation of having enhanced sound and, and vibration use of uh, certain materials 
that plan isn't that document is an approved document, therefore they must implement in accordance with that um, the, the materials that are proposed as mitigation. But You're, there is a condition that specifically talks about noise, which I think was the point the council is making. If yeah, I'm if I'm reading, noise, why aren't we then conditioning vibration as well? I accept they're in the report, but in that case, why do we do the noise at all? Yeah. And we, we always do noise pretty standardly, I must admit. Yeah. Sorry, so what, what vibration concerns have you got with this type of development? Well, it's alongside the, rail. the railway. I, I, the, the, there's You're a concern about, about protection. Um, I have to say, I agree with Mandip um, Mahotra on this. I, I think that we've got the um, approved document and that has to be complied with. Um, I understand what we're saying between the noise and the vibration, but what what would you actually want put into the condition to to protect from the heart? I understand you're saying about the rail, et cetera, but is there is there a specific noise condition on the railway? We've got noise, noise conditions in. It's vibration the council's raising. You you have conditions to ensure the residents are protected from adverse noise. And it's whether or not we have conditions in to protect them from adverse vibration and recognising it's next to the railway line, I would have thought that was a reasonable concern and consideration. I'm told that that is a matter that's dealt with under building regulations, that's what the report says, but similarly noise is dealt with under building regulations. Quite, so, quite sorry, if I could well, it, so, right. so vibration has been used as a condition before, but that's when the developer hasn't done a report like this developer right. to address right. vibration. Thank right. you. So, fine. Um, that's the answer. That's the answer. That's, that's the fine. Answer. Thank you. Thank you. for me thank oh you done it you did do it sorry I, I, I it just we got distracted sorry uh, proposal was just Councillor Oswald and a second uh, thank you oh, I did you second right I sorry we got lost in an additional discussion there um, all those in favour please clearly show thank you right we move um, to item 8 sorry yeah, it wasn't no because you didn't vote for it, which for reasons we well understand, and consistent reasons we well understand. <laughs> um, can I move to Unit One, Elston Business Centre? I am conscious we're now um, well over time. Um, this was deferred by us on 24th of October, uh, following uh, concerns about the car park. Um, the report does detail that they have now come up with a mechanism for making sure that car park can only be unlocked properly. Um, and, there, and there is an addendum as well um, to say that it can't come into operation until that PIN number system is in place. Police are happy with that. Do members want any more on that? Oh, by the way, you need a notwithstanding condition that's in, the, um, that's in there in the addendum because obviously the plans before you don't show the barrier. Chairman, this is very recent. We had the presentation on this. Um, the, my concern has been addressed and I'm now happy to move officers' recommendations. I'll second that. Okay, all those in favour, please show. Thank you very much for me. Um, I'm saving Mandit's voice very slightly here. Um, land, I can't do it with this one though. Land to the rear 2 to 24 Horton Road, usually. There are some minor changes to this, but the, the, the in essence change to this is building height is the real bit, isn't it? That's right. We've already granted planning permission at this application site for a, a fairly substantive development of 86 residential units. This application is essentially seeking to make lots of small changes but have to be wrapped up in a new planning permission, which is why we're seeking to vary condition to the approved plans. The biggest of the changes is an increase in building height of 60 centimetres at maximum, and that's just to inc incorporate uh, fire evacuation corridors, sprinkler systems, etc. The application is, we don't really use the word de minimis anymore, but the application is considered acceptable and is recommended for approval. Councillor Thank you, Chair. It's for safety reasons. It is de minimis, in my opinion. I move officer's recommendation. Uh, does Councillor Yarra want a second? Oh, that's very good. Thank you very much. All those in favour, please clearly show. That one is unanimous. Good. I now move to the last item on this agenda, although we have an agenda B. 501 to 504 Stone Close Usley, subject to an addendum. Um, 
Adit, please, could you explain this one to us? It is 501 and 504 Stone Close is an industrial business area. That's the first key point to raise. So the industrial business area is, as, as I'm pointing out on the plan, there are some residential properties on Horton Road. So this is a unit whereby it needs to consider its, its neighbourliness. The application is proposing the demolition of the existing buildings on site just to provide newer, modern facilities. Uh, the application is recommended for approval. We have, throughout the application process, um, done quite a lot of negotiation because this built form here, which is otherwise known as an inspection or valet bay, um, was located here. It would have been eight metres high, quite an eyesore on Horton Road, and in all other respects, if it wasn't a J on a main road next to residential properties, uh, it's an IBA, it would have been acceptable. But we have managed to get the applicants to move that quite significant um, inspection bay to within the site. There is no uh, detrimental impact on neighbours. Uh, the application is proposing an increase in height of only one and a half metres, I think. Um, it is all within the report, and the application is considered acceptable in, in all other respects and recommended for approval. Can I just take one clarification? Bear in mind, I think we do know what this is, which is a car servicing operation. Are the use classes applied for acceptable? Are they, in other words, are they all required to cover this application, B1, B2 and B8? The if they are, that's fine. But are, are just No, we're offering a flexible use because although the operator is tentative at the moment, it's not confirmed. And I think in that respect, we need to offer them the option. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, just wanted to clarify, Councillor Yarrow. Could I just raise uh, one point, Chairman? I didn't read anything in the in the literature that said how they were going to deal with contaminated water because it's a, clearly a servicing station. There's going to be oil and water mixed together. How are we going to ensure that doesn't enter the system? And it in other words, I think is is it covered under that sustainable water management, or do we need something more? Now, it's a very valid question if it is a car use. It is a valid question, but because we don't, it isn't confirmed, uh, we can add an additional condition should the use be a, um, a car use uh, that that is covered. Well, I think, I think it's very relevant because they will produce a lot of waste material, including oil. We don't want it winding up places it shouldn't. Uh, Sorry, I'd, I'd point BIV says identify vulnerable receptors and prevent pollution of the receiving groundwater and or surface water through yeah, appropriate that's methods. That's what I was asking the question, did subs cover us? So I, water so cover us? I think it does cover it. But, but, so if, if, but I'd happily double check with the Flood and Water Management Officer if the committee would want to delegate that to me. I, I will, uh, I, and only issue a decision once I've double checked could you, yeah, I, with I, the Flood and Water Management yeah, Officer. I will be happy to take the Flood and Water Management Officer's judgment because we know that she does police these matters carefully. But I would ask that if the committee go with the recommendation in a moment that that is double checked with her that if if this does turn out to be what we think it might be which is a garage and inspection service uh, uh, that does that need strengthening or a separate uh, condition that uh, uh, i would delegate the authority to add yes. but, but not take away yes, yes. add but not yes. take away you're not getting a take away there's no takeaways on this it's, it's add options only can we i like that chairman sorry can i just ask then, are, we, are we talking about receptor tanks or, or what sort of what sort of receptor have, have they got there a lot of um, service stations have receptor tanks that yeah. are emptied every now and then yeah. for all the right reasons because we don't want <coughs> contaminate anything contam to go into the water course and, and contaminate. Yeah, I don't know is the short answer, but I think that's what we need to check. I know the flood and water management officer because of her environment agency background has the expertise to <laughs> to, to nail this to one. appropriately uh, change the, the condition if it's required. Well, I think we we have met her, and, and uh, yes, she. She does know what she does. Anybody got any others on this one, Councillor Edwards? Are you about to move it? I, I, I was. I, I would just say I think it's, it's a helpful investment in the area. It's pleasing to see that there has been some adjustment on the height to limit the impact on the residences nearby, and I'm very pleased to move this. Seconder, please, Councillor Yarrow. Thank you very much. All those in favour, please clearly show that one is approved. Okay. I do have, and then I'm going to ask. No, don't. You don't need to read this yet. Um, we have an agenda item B, um, which was brought forward um, because we thought we needed to, uh, planning thought they needed to urgently resolve the situation regarding an S106. It has now become apparent that further work is required and further information is required in this report to make it um, 
understandable. Uh, the urgency no, it, it is, is not as thought. So could I ask for committee, please, to defer consideration of Agenda Item 12 um, B to a, a future meeting? All those in favour of deferral, please show. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for your hard work at 5 to 8. Um, North Planning will...